So this exercise was all about memory allocation. So you should be able to understand how the heap is managed. So these two basic functions, we have malloc and free. And some of you might have tried uh, Googling, which is perfectly fine. And if you Googled close enough, you would find that something like this is actually discussed in the standard book on C, which is uh, pictured here on the top right corner, the C programming language by Koenigen and Ritchie. In the second edition, it's in section 8.7. So uh, this is a standard uh, problem when you try to allocate memory. So we've seen memory allocations in different ways. So we've seen uh, global variables in data and BSS segments. We've seen local variables on the stack. And this third, third sort of memory you can actually allocate uh, is heap memory. So heap is just what we call anonymous memory. So it's just a pointer to a bunch of bytes in memory. And uh, this bunch of bytes has to be administered somehow. And that's uh, why we're, we're trying to do this in this exercise. So this implementation by Koenigen and Ritchie, if you try to look it up in the book, actually, you will easily find out it doesn't work. <laughs> uh, there's some reasons why it doesn't work. Uh, first, it's written in a relatively ancient dialect of C. So this book is like, I think, uh, 20 to 30 years old now. Uh, second, it has a number of typos, and that's a bit unfortunate. Nevertheless, uh, we'll go to some details here, which are not exact code, because I don't want to give the user solution now, uh, because you have time to hand in your solution. But I'll give you some hints on how to do things correctly on the most common problems. So in general, for uh, implementing memory allocation for the heap, we need three things. We need a free list, so we need to, need, uh, to know which uh, parts of our memory are actually unused. So when an allocation request comes in, then we can assign this allocation request some of the memory from our free memory here. Uh, so this free list usually has a free block and the header and user data. And we have then two functions, malloc. So malloc is passed the size of a memory block to allocate and returns a pointer to the start of the data in this memory block. And finally, we have a free function. So free puts a block back on the free list. And if there's adjacent free blocks now on our free list, we can what we call coalesce them. So we can uh, make a larger block out of two or maybe even three bigger blocks that have been there before. So let's take a look at our heap. What's actually happening? We've seen this before. Oh, oops, that's a typo. We have two BSS segments. That's one too many, sorry. Uh, so assume this BSS segment, the second one doesn't exist. So essentially we know we have a static memory allocation for our program code, so the text segment, and then we have uh, data and a BSS segment, so data for our initialized variables here, global variables, and BSS for our uninitialized global variables. And we have our stack, which we already have seen, which grows from the top. So our stack contains the stack frames for our functions we call. So it contains information about local variables, return addresses, and so on. Now there might be another situation where you need maybe larger amounts of memory. For example, if you want to load like an image, a picture from, from disk, uh, because you want to write uh, the next best Photoshop clone or something like this. And this anonymous memory, uh, which can vary in size because the size of your picture on disk will also vary depending on the resolution. Uh, this can be best allocated on the heap. So the heap is a memory segment that starts uh, in memory above the BSS segment and grows towards increasing addresses, whereas the stack starts at the top of memory and grows towards decreasing addresses. So whenever we have additional memory on the stack, the stack pointer decreases, whereas when we have additional memory allocated on the heap, uh, our heap size would increase. So we apply this like this. So uh, what we do here is uh, we have a function f, for example, and we have a character pointer p. So uh, a character pointer, as you know, only holds an address, but not the contents. So if we have an uh, in a, in a uh, string like this one, so we have a character pointer variable called string, and we initialize this with hello, we don't store the characters hello and the terminating zero byte in this variable here. But what happens is that the compiler allocates memory for this string hello somewhere. 
and then actually obtains the pointer, so the start address of, to the, of that memory region. And this start address is then copied into our character pointer. So an assignment like this means we only reserve space for this variable uh, as much uh, as we need for storing a pointer. And whatever we store there is stored somewhere else in memory. And now we can make use of this when we're using pointers. So declaring character pointer P doesn't allocate any storage except for the pointer itself. So let's say we need a string of size eight, including the terminating zero byte as always. So we want to dynamically allocate memory for this. And we maybe when we don't need this string any longer, we want to get rid of that memory again. Then we can say, okay, we have this character pointer here and we declare a variable i size, which is an integer variable of eight. And then we can call malloc passing the i size as parameter. So we malloc eight bytes. And this parameter is always bytes on Unix systems. And if malloc succeeds, we are returned a pointer to this newly allocated memory area of eight bytes in size, at least eight bytes in size to be precise. And this is copied, this address is copied into our character pointer so we can use it as a string. For malloc, there's the specific situation if the memory allocation fails because we ran out of memory, for example, then we get a null pointer returned. So in uh, production code, we would need to check for the return value here from our malloc function. So when you use malloc and free, uh, it's important to take care of your pointer types. So in C, there's a special generic pointer to any type, which can be converted to other pointer types. And this is so-called void pointer. And malloc actually doesn't take an integer value in modern Unix systems, but it takes a value that is a so-called size t. So a size t is also an integer variable, but it is type def to size t to actually indicate we want to indicate a size here. So uh, what we do is we have this uh, signature for a function here. So it's called malloc, obviously. It takes a size t parameter and it returns a void pointer. So a generic pointer type that can be converted to any other pointer type you like, because you don't want to store a pointer to void, but you want to get a character pointer in one case and maybe a pointer to an array of bytes for storing a, a picture or whatever you can imagine. So if malloc succeeds, it returns a pointer to a memory space that it's allocated of the size we actually indicated in our parameter size, or it returns null, so a pointer to the value null usually if the request cannot be satisfied. And so we can call it like this. So int pointer x, so we want to have memory for storing one integer variable here. And this uh, is obtained using malloc, using the parameter size of int. So size of is a built-in compiler function that actually returns the size in bytes. So the number of bytes that's taken by the variable in the brackets here. So uh, no matter what system you're on, so how large your integer is, this always correct uh, returns the right size for this integer on your machine you're compiling for. So on most computers, an integer is four bytes in size. So size of int would just return four. And so we would alloc four bytes here. Uh, so malloc returns a void pointer. This can be converted into any pointer type. So we want an integer pointer out of our malloc result. So we do a typecast to an integer pointer here. Uh, so our compiler doesn't complain. Otherwise you'd get at least a warning. And well, you can then use this uh, memory area, area to store your integer variable. And when you don't need it anymore, you can call free. So you pass the pointer you originally obtained here uh, to free and then your memory is deallocated. Uh, notice that free has a void return type. So void means it doesn't return anything. So we assume that free always succeeds or is silently ignored if you try to free some memory that was already freed, for example. Okay, so let's look at an example use case for our heap behavior here. So here we have our uh, program and let's say we have written our malloc and free functions ourselves. So these are the prototypes here. And uh, so uh, first we call malloc with a parameter of three. So we would allocate three bytes here. So initially our heap was empty. And after executing this first line, the arrow points to, 
we have three bytes allocated on the heap here, maybe at the beginning, and the pointer that's returned points to the beginning of that memory space. Then we have another memory allocation of one byte. So we have another byte that's just using the next free space on the heap here. Uh, and the pointer to that is returned in P2. And then we can allocate another four bytes here and get a pointer P3. So that's not very exciting. So the next question is what happens when we call free on an element in the middle here. So on the uh, memory area of one byte that P2 points to. So this is our next instruction here. So this means, well, this memory is deallocated. Uh, for our program, nothing changes that much because it doesn't change the value of P2. So P2 still points to that allocated memory area, but our memory allocator is now free to reallocate this memory for something else. So that's a common source of programming errors. If we would use that value of P2 after our free, we would access something else in memory. So at the same address, but our memory allocator could have decided in between to store something else there. Well, then we can do a different allocation. So P4 cannot be allocated in that gap because we try to allocate six bytes here. So the allocation of P4 needs space on top here and we get another point of P4 back. When we then free P3, we have a larger block that's free in the middle here. And so our final memory allocation here can now be satisfied right in the middle. So now we have still P2 pointing to this because nobody changed P2. Uh, but the value that's interesting for us is of course P5. That was what was returned by the current malloc call. And we also have P3 pointing right to the middle of it. So reusing a free pointer is really, really dangerous. So you see that when we have a gap that's large enough, we can reuse this gap to store something else. And that's what we do with our first fit algorithm actually. And then finally, we can free some uh, blocks here. So we free P1, P4, and P5. And all our pointers would still be containing the previous addresses, but they would no longer point to any valid data in memory. So uh, usually when you call malloc, you have to call free on that pointer before exiting your program. Uh, if you don't do this and call exit, so the uh, library function, libc function exit, then you're lucky because uh, libc, uh, the exit function takes care of clearing up your memory for you. Um, but if you have a long running program and you do mallocs and mallocs and mallocs and never do any uh, free on objects you no longer use, then your heap grows and grows and grows. And this is what's called a memory leak. So this is another problem, especially for systems with small memories like embedded systems. If you have to manually allocate and free memory, then uh, if you forget to free some memory or you forget a pointer because you overwrote the pointer accidentally, uh, then you allocate more and more memory and you have no ways to free it except for terminating your program which is in, in some cases unacceptable because if you're on a one year mission flying your a rocket to Mars, well, that might take a bit longer if I look at the re recent results of SpaceX, but nevertheless. So uh, uh, then you cannot just reboot your rocket while you're flying to Mars. I think that wouldn't be a good idea to get rid of uh, some, some over allocated memory. Now, if you're used to programming in Java or Python, this might seem completely strange to you because in these high level languages, memory allocation is automatic. Now, of course, also in Java or Python, there are variables or data structures that you allocated that are not used anymore. So if you don't manually get rid of them, uh, there has to be a system service to do this because otherwise your memory consumption would grow and grow also for your Java and Python processes until you would run out of memory. And that's obviously what doesn't happen at least for every Java and Python program. So in memory managed languages, so not C, but Java or Python, you have something running in the background, which is called a garbage allocator. And that goes through your allocated memory list and checks for objects in that memory space. So in the object heap of Java or Python that are no longer referenced. So they have no pointer pointing to that. And so this garbage allocator regularly goes round and just gets rid of these unused memory objects. Now, the problem is this garbage allocator 
takes quite a bit of overhead, especially if you have large amounts of memory allocated. So this slows down your program. And since a garbage allocation needs to be run atomically, we've seen what atomic means in terms of operating systems. So you cannot have any allocations in between when you're reorganizing your storage space. This means that the execution of your program itself is stopped every so and so many hundreds of milliseconds for a significant amount of time. And uh, if you looked at our recent operating systems lecture with real-time systems, if a garbage collector takes up lots of this time and is actually unpredictable how long it would take, this would not be ideal for real-time systems. So here, malloc and free, they seem very primitive and they take, you need to apply care to use them correctly. But still, when you need to have predictability in your code, that's what you're going to use. Okay, so uh, we've just seen allocations and freeze. So obviously what you want to do is you want to use the heap. Uh, so uh, my, my impression was that at least some of you uh, really had no idea how to use it afterwards. So let's look at a bit of an, a modified example here. So we have uh, some memory allocations as before. So we mem allocate an area of four bytes here for P1. We allocate uh, one byte for P2. Uh, that should be a gray box, sorry, uh, copy paste error. The important thing is, how, however, this line here in uh, starting in red. So we have now an, a pointer to an integer variable and this name of the pointer is just called var. So this doesn't contain an integer variable, but just the address of an integer variable. And now we call malloc of four bytes here. So we get a pointer returned. This pointer is var. Sorry, there's really a copy and paste uh, foo here. So var here points to this memory area. And then we can dereference this pointer here we just obtained from malloc. Of course, we would need to check for zero in a real world program. And then we could write something to it. So this construct here writes to the memory that var points to. And this memory are these four bytes we just allocated. So it writes the bytes of our integer variable, hexadecimal one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, into the memory location pointed to by var. And since we have little endian byte order, if we don't remember byte order, check your C crash course. So it writes the least significant bytes, so the least uh, the last two hex digits here in the lowest address. So hexadecimal 78 ends up in the first byte P3 points to or var points to here then five, six in the next, then three, four, and finally one, two. So this is exactly four bytes, so this fits. Now you could have only uh, allocated two bytes here and still try to write a variable of four bytes in there. This is another common problem when handling stuff like this. So you would write over your allocated area here, and this would probably overwrite some other data, uh, which would then be a problem that's hard to debug. So when you no longer need the value of that integer variable here, now you can just free that memory. So you can pass the pointer var to the free function and then uh, the indication would be there that this memory block is freed. Now, uh, what actually happens here when I free a memory block is that it's just added to our free list again. So free doesn't actually erase any memory in this area. So it doesn't erase the data, so it's still there. That's why it's very difficult to find this bug, a bug like this. So using a pointer after it was freed, just because the memory is there for some time until a new allocation overrides it. So this can happen at arbitrary points in time. Now, uh, this example here still is a bit simplified because it does not consider the metadata uh, required to actually administer our heap. So we need to store the information which blocks are free, for example. Some implementations also store information about which blocks are used. So uh, this example is a bit simplifying and we'll show more details in the upcoming slides. So, but the biggest problem we've seen, and this is something I, I uh, want to mention explicitly, is that some of you really were struggling with pointer arithmetics in C. So we've, seen, and, and that's why we uh, actually uh, gave a hint to this in the exercise sheet, I must notice. And this is just slides from our C crash course. So if you want to read up on this uh, slide 54 and the following. So we know we can do computations using pointers and we know that uh, array, array notations in C are just equivalent to pointer notations. So if we have a character array, 
then all is fine because a character in C is usually eight bits, so one byte in size. So if we do arithmetics on this, we have character text equals our string quark. So text is actually a pointer to our string here, which points to the first character, so to our Q. So when we now declare another pointer variable C, which is a character pointer, and assign it the value text plus one, then this points to the next character. So we text points to Q and we add one, so we point to the next byte here. But we only point to the next byte because our base type is one byte in size here. So we can do something like then we can dereference this character pointer, write a new character to it, and we would swap this U here for a W. So we would go from quark to a quark. <laughs> and we can also do it uh, using a direct addition. So text plus four, for example, zero, one, two, three, four, would replace the K here by a B. And we could also use negative offsets. So C minus one, C points to our uh, second character here. So C minus one points to the first one and would overwrite the first character with a Z here. So we've seen these equivalences here. Text of four is another expression four, dereferencing the address at memory address text plus four and so on and so forth. So here's just an example for these equivalences to see uh, that it actually works easily for character variables. Now, the problem is that starting with this example, and that's what, what I assume might have caused the confusion for many, uh, yeah, actually makes it a bit too simple because in this example here, uh, our pointer arithmetic, so adding or subtracting a value from or to a pointer actually works like just adding bytes to addresses. So we would address bytes. This works only if your base type is a character pointer so, or a pointer to any base type that's one byte in size. So it could be u int 8t, for example. However, if you have a pointer that points to something bigger, then pointer arithmetic actually works a bit differently than you would actually expect if you just consider counting bytes. So a pointer arithmetic also works uh, for example, in our equivalents for arrays, but also just for any base type, that's not of type character. So uh, we know that we have this equivalence. So if we add an offset S to a pointer here, this uh, is equivalent to the address of our element S in our array. So if our base type, base type of our array would be four bytes in size, like it would be an int something, then our pointer would be incremented by four if we, for example, reference P of one or P plus plus. So that's important with pointer arithmetics. The address difference that you obtain when adding a value to the pointer is not the difference in bytes, but it's a difference in the number of elements this pointer points to. So if you point to an integer, which is four byte in size and you increase your pointer, by one, your byte value of your pointer is increased by four. If you point to a structure with 500 bytes and uh, you increment that pointer, then your pointer is increased by 500. So you point uh, to uh, the memory address that's 500 bytes further up in memory. So exactly behind that structure. And that's why this makes sense. But of course, this is a source of many common errors here. And I think that was a problem many of you actually had here. So it's good we talk about this. So for our real implementation, uh, it's getting a bit more complex because in addition to the data in the heap, we've seen in our lecture different approaches to actually store this meta information about which blocks are free and how large a block is. So memory blocks in our heap should actually have this structure here so in addition to our user data, which is stored in the uh, final bytes of our allocated block, we have two additional data elements. Now, the first one is a pointer to the next block because we need to keep, for example, a free list. And the second one is an integer, which indicates how many, uh, how many bytes I used up in this block. Uh, so you can be free in your allocation to choose if this size actually indicates just how many user data bytes are used. That's in the example here. 
So for example, if we have malloc of four and write this hexadecimal number into this memory area here, we get a number four here, which indicates we have four bytes allocated here. And then we have the bytes here written in the data area in order. You can also use an alternative approach and store as the size, the complete size, including this pointer and the size variable itself. This would make the implementation a bit easier for adding stuff, um, but you have to choose one or the other option. You cannot mix and match them. So what we have to do is we have to figure out which memory is free first in order to implement malloc because malloc has to find a free block that's large enough and this free block has to be found in our heap. So to do this, we uh, define a structure uh, for our header uh, containing a pointer to the next free block, which we call pointer and containing a size of the block. So our two metadata elements we've seen before. And to simplify memory elements, uh, we can choose to make all memory blocks to be a multiple of the header size. And we should also ensure that the header is aligned with the largest data type we want to store in there, for example, a long. So essentially, uh, we need to make sure that our header starts at an address that's evenly divisible, for example, by size of long on our computer. And we can use a union in C to force memory alignments. There are different approaches to do this. We'll present this using a union here and we'll app use this a bit. So if you've never seen a union before, well, check our C crash course again, because we mentioned them nevertheless. So a union actually uh, indicates to a C compiler that this data structure here may contain either an integer value IVAL or a float variable FWAL or a pointer to a character called SWAL. So it's not a struct where you have all three stored uh, one after the other, but a union means that you have an overlay. So either you can store this integer variable IVAL in this union, or at the same memory address, you store a float variable FWAL, or at the same memory address, you store a character value as well. In many programming languages, this is not allowed because this would allow writing a variable as an integer and reading it out as a float. In C, you want this because some of the basic functionality of converting data and so on is based on this. So what you need to do is to define a union that's large enough to hold the largest data type here. And we can do this like this. So we can uh, say, okay, we have a union, uh, which is a header. And in this union, we have our metadata here. So this is a structure containing a union header pointer pointer. So we again have this recursive definition that this pointer here points to itself as a data type here. And after that, we have unsigned and unsigned int. Usually we can shorten this to unsigned. So this is copied from Kerning and Ritchie of uh, which we call size. So this is a structure having these two elements here. So we can store a pointer and at the same time, we can store a size. So we have a pointer in memory and after that we have size in memory. Now, alternatively to that structure here, you could store another variable here. Uh, and we call this uh, data type here a line. So this is a stupid little trick to force the alignment of the first data structure. Uh, so what we do here is we type def uh, type align to a basic type long. So we could have also written long x here, but align makes it clearer what goes, what goes on. And so by using this alignment here, the compiler needs to uh, or is forced to actually start this union in memory at an address divisible by the size of this data type here. So the, by the size of a long variable here. And this means that it's always ensured that our structure also starts at that alignment here. So this is a neat little trick we can use. In more modern C variants like GCC or Clang, you have extensions uh, which are not in the C standard to define alignments. So if you want to need, uh, know more about this, uh, there's this, well, very extensive uh, discussion at that URL by, by Eric Raymond, one of the early Linux developers here. So this would force alignment, especially for storing our free block information. In fact, you would never use this X here 
It's just used to force the compiler actually to adhere to this alignment. Okay, now we want to allocate memory in units of certain bytes. So we want to keep our memory aligned, uh, which means that the best thing we can do is that we round up our requested memory size to a multiple of the header size. This makes it much easier uh, to, to handle free blocks because we know that each free block and then each allocated block is always a multiple of the header size. So what you do when you, uh, uh, when you get a memory request for n bytes, uh, then you need to round it up. How do you do this? Well, you know you have a header of size of header, which has to be stored inside of your free block. And then you have to store the n bytes additionally as data in your block. So the overall size you would require is size of your header plus size of your data, which is n bytes. Now having to round it up means uh, that uh, what you do is you uh, actually calculate this size, subtract one, and then do this division by the size of a header. So this is an integer division. So this gives you the number of size of header by uh, based uh, elements in your memory block that's as large or lower than what is required in terms of this size of the header. So this is the uh, lower uh, Gauss bracket in mathematical notations. So the lower integer bound for this division here. So if you just round it like this, uh, you're missing out on data if you don't have an exact multiple of size of header in n bytes. So what you do, uh, you add one to this to ensure that you always have the correct number of bytes allocated here and don't waste too much money, uh, money, memory, of course. But yeah, time is money and memory is also money. So when you write your malloc function here and you get past the parameter n bytes, then what you can do is you declare another variable n units here and n units is actually this rounded up uh, number of units here. So you know how many units of size of header will you would use uh, for your memory allocation. This makes life easier for you. So when it comes to working with a free list, we've seen in the lecture that we use a circular linked list. So all of our free blocks are linked together, whereas we don't actually keep a record of our blocks that have been allocated and are in use. Uh, so to optimize this, uh, first we, have a circ we can have a circular linked list. So we don't have a special condition of arriving at the end of the list and then having a null pointer and then having to start again but using a circular list makes it easier to actually just go from whatever location through our list until we hit the start again. In addition, we need to know uh, where our start list, uh, where our free list starts. So what we get is a pointer to our free list, which indicates where it actually starts. Now, uh, this free list doesn't have to be sorted in order of increasing addresses. It could be arbitrary, but keeping this list in order of increasing addresses makes it easier uh, if we have uh, adjacent free blocks or if, uh, that we want to coalesce, to actually coalesce them because we only have to search our list in order. So uh, we've seen allocation algorithms. Uh, so to handle a request for memory, you have to find a free block that satisfies the request. So it has at least free memory for our data plus our meta information plus whatever we rounded it up to now. So the size must be big enough or bigger. And then the question is which block to return. So we've seen, for example, the first fit algorithm. So we have this linked list of free blocks and we search for the first one that's big enough. And that's one you should implement here. And we also have a best fit algorithm, which means you keep a list of free blocks. And then you would search for the smallest one that is big enough. So you don't you're not happy with the first one you find that fits, but you go through all of the list to figure out what's the smallest one uh, to reduce the fragmentation of your memory. So you should implement first fit, that's a bit easier, uh, but best fit would be a, a relatively simple extension here. So the first task you were asked to do uh, is this one here. So the file my malloc contains a C program skeleton for the heap allocator and 
compared to real operating systems implementations, we decided to make it a bit simpler here. So we decided we just have a fixed memory area for our heap. So the heap is unable to grow if we need more memory. And we just implemented this as a simple array of bytes uh, holding 64 kilobytes in our example. And uh, your task was first to implement your own heap memory allocator, uh, in this case, malloc. And we call this my malloc, so you don't have any conflicts to the libc provided malloc, fun malloc function. Uh, so, so that's just a different name. And of course, this my malloc function should work like malloc, so it should allocate a block of memory of the given size from the heap. Uh, and of course, you would need this metadata information also stored there. So you would actually allocate a larger block, but for your program, it would just look like a block of memory of the size would be allocated. And additionally, you should implement a free function to release a block that's pointed to by the parameter. So you have your yeah, well code like this here. So you call <coughs> my malloc, for example, for 42 bytes, <coughs> get a pointer returned, <coughs> sorry. And then for real world code, you would check if this pointer is not equal to zero, then you can do something with this memory and free it again. And otherwise you can just complain that your malloc has failed. So how does this first fit algorithm work? So we've seen we have our pointed list of free blocks here in blue. And we start at the beginning of the list and then we sequence through the list. So we start at our initial pointer here and uh, we always keep a pointer to the previous element just in case. And then we stop, so this is pref and pointer p points to our current element here. And then we stop when reaching the first block that's actually big enough. Uh, why do we keep this pointer to the previous element? Because if we found a, an element that's big enough like that one here, then we have to change the next pointer of our previous element to jump over that because we're just going to allocate this here. So we might just jump over that and point this pointer to the next element in the most simple case. And then we would return an address inside of our block. So an address after our metadata information to the user. So that's a simple case here. We find a perfect fit. So let's say we have an allocation for a number of bytes, and then we find a block that's exactly the size of our allocated of our data amount to allocate, rounded up, plus the size of our metadata, which is our black rectangle here. So we have our metadata, which contains the next pointer and the size here in this black, rec uh, black rectangle here, and the rest is data here. So uh, when we found such a block, the first thing we do is we remove this block from our free list because we want to allocate it. And since it fits perfectly, so we found a block that's exactly the size we need for the allocation, we can just remove it completely from the free list. So this means we need to change the pointer pointing to the next element in the previous element in our free list, actually to the one that was the next element for the block we're going to allocate. So we skip this block here, now in our free list because we're going to allocate it. And uh, we change this pointer here in our previous element to point to our own next pointer here. So this is our P element, which contains our next pointer in the free list pointing to here. And so we copy the pointer from here to here. So now we have removed this element from our linked list and just point from here to the next free element after we allocated this. And what we do then is we return the current element to the user. Now, what we need to do here is to skip the header. So we cannot return the start of that element to the user because the user assumes that all of that memory starting by pointer can be used by itself. So we actually only have to return the start address of the start of the data region. And here we can use pointer arithmetics. So if this pointer P actually points to such a header structure we've just defined. Then we know if we add one to this pointer, this points to the byte immediately after your header structure. And this is exactly the byte where your data begins. So what you do in such an allocation, you don't, you don't return P, so you're pointed to your current element, which is a pointer to your header, but you return P plus one, which is a pointer to the first byte after your header, which by coincidence is a pointer to the first element of your data, a section of your block, which is exactly what the user should see. So this would be the very simple malloc uh, version if you have a perfect fit. Now life is not perfect. So the usual case is that your block is too big. 
So if you find a block that's big enough, because we know it can be as big or bigger, and you find out it's actually bigger than we, what we need, we would waste space by uh, completely allocating that block to the request. So what we can do is we can split this block. So originally we would have this block here in our free list, which would be large. And when an allocation comes in, we want to split it into two parts. And what we can do is we can actually split it so that the final part of our original block is being allocated here. And that the initial part here is just reduced in size. So this makes our life a bit easier because only all we have to do is when we uh, actually change this here, we have to reduce the size by the number of units if we keep this in units here. So we automatically get a block that's shorter here. And then we have to allocate the second block here, which P points to now, to our user. So essentially we have to increase P by S size. And that's what makes it easy because we're always pointing in elements of size header here because we aligned this. And so this means we always arrive at the correct location here by increasing this by size. So note that this here is kept in units, not in bytes. You can keep this in bytes, but then you would have to multiply it by hand uh, to get the correct value here. So this makes it a bit easier here. So P now after executing this line here points to the first byte of the block we want to actually allocate, which contains the header information. And then since it's a pointer to a header type, we can just set its size value to whatever number of units should be allocated in this block. The advantage of this is by allocating the remainder of the block and not the start, that we don't have to change anything in our free list because uh, the only thing that happens to our free list is that this one element that we just split up just got a bit shorter, but it's still valid. Of course, we need to check that it still has space for at least storing the header because otherwise, well, uh, we would have a problem. All right. So of course we have two special cases and it would be nice if we can combine them. So we could do this. So what you have to do is you have to iterate over your free list here and notice this is pseudocode. This won't work directly in implementation. Uh, so you have to uh, go through a, a start pointer here. So you start with your start pointer to the free list here. And then you have to go through the pointer here. Uh, note that this here, and this is strange Koenig original notation here. This is a for loop with nothing in between. Uh, because this for loop returns somewhere. So we don't need a termination condition. And for iter every iteration of the for loop, and this is a bit strange C code, we do two instructions here. So first we set our previous pointer to the current pointer. So we advance to the next element of our free list. And then uh, we set our pointer here to the next pointer just pointed to. And then we check. So for the current element, we're just iterating in our free list. If the size of this element, so the header field indicating the size, if this is larger or equal than the number of units that was requested, then we can first check, is this a perfect allocation? And if this is a perfect allocation, a perfect fit, we just change the pointer in the free list to remove that block we found from the free list. Uh, otherwise, we do what we've seen on the previous slide. So we just reduce the size of the current element we found, uh, then actually uh, set the size of the next, uh, set the pointer to point to the memory area, area we want to return to the user, and then set the size of this element. So we've just added size to our pointer. Um, so, and then we just set the new size to the allocated memory area. And because we can combine this, we just return P plus one again. So this is a neat little trick. So either we just reuse this pointer P we're pointing to and then point to the data area here, or we changed P to point to the second half, which we're going to allocate of the block we split and then return that one here. So uh, when we make the free list a circular list, this has an advantage because any element in the biggest big list can be the start. So if we cycle through our list once, in a list that actually points from its end to the beginning, 
then we know we haven't missed any of the free elements. So we don't have to include a, a special case for finding the end of a list. You could also do this. This would make your code a bit more clumsy, but it would work. So an optimization here would uh, just uh, to start from wherever your last block was found. And we've also discussed this as a possible optimization in the lecture. So before you return your allocated block, you would just advance your free pointer to uh, the previous free element that you found. So you would, would move the head. So we would never start from scratch again for the second, third, fourth memory allocation, but you would just continue uh, where you left off finding a free block the last time. What this means is uh, that this is an optimization. So you don't accumulate uh, any uh, fragmentation at the beginning, but you try tend to, to split it or to, to spread it over your whole free memory area. And you can refer to, to the lecture slides on, on details of this. We've discussed this there briefly. So of course you can have the problem that especially for our very limited uh, implementation where we only have 64 kilobytes and can't grow it, that you can't find a block that's big enough. So if you find out that you completely cycled through the list and it's a cyclic list, well, then you can actually check if you arrived back at the start of the list. So you can check in your for loop if you actually arrived with your pointer at the initial free pointer where you started off. Then you know you cycled once through the list you, didn't, you never return from this for loop, so from your malloc function. So if you never return from your malloc function, you uh, cycle through your list without having success. And this means your pointer has arrived again at the free pointer where you started. So initially here. And this means, yeah, you couldn't find a free block that's big enough, so you would complain, you would handle the error. So usually for malloc, this might mean that you return a zero so a zero pointer to indicate to the calling program that, well, you couldn't find memory, bad luck, out of memory, buy more memory. Yes. Okay. So you see, we have these corner cases and you have to make sure to handle them. And what we present here is a bit of an optimization to see how it can be done, but you can actually choose to handle these corner cases without these little tricks we've shown. So what to do when you run out? In our example, so in our task, you would, you would simply fail because the fixed main memory is just full and you cannot move blocks around. So you cannot do a defragmentation because you have handed out pointers. So if you would move any allocated block in memory to, find, uh, to build a larger block when allocation comes, the original pointers you returned from that malloc for that block would become invalid, which would mean uh, your program would do the wrong thing. So that's a restriction, obviously, of memory allocation here. Uh, in the general case, so if you would write a malloc allocation for a libc, you could try to ask the operating system for additional memory. And you can do this because, well, malloc and free are not implemented in the kernel. So the kernel doesn't know a thing about it. The kernel actually only keeps a, a, a record of the uh, most upper used memory address of the program, excluding the stack. And you can ask, Unix to in increase this limit. And this limit is historically called the break. So the break is the limit between the memory that's used in virtual memory by a process and any addresses above that that are currently unused. So if you really need more memory, you can ask the operating system to give you more memory. This is you done using the S break system call. So S break stands for set this break. And you can ask uh, your uh, uh, your uh, operating system to please increase this by uh, some am uh, amount. So you can ask S break and units and you get returned a new pointer to the new top of memory. So this would be an additional block you could add to the end of your free list. And only if this also returns now, then you're really out of memory on a Unix system and then your memory allocation fails. So we decided to make this a bit easier here by only having a fixed memory allocation of these 64 kilobytes or however you defined it in your code. And then just failing when you run out of memory on a real system, you can try to get more memory dynamically. So uh, malloc wasn't that difficult with our tricks, I'd say. Free is a bit more complex. So free, to implement this, the user passes a pointer to a memory block. So this is just our variable AP here, which we pass. 
And the free function uh, doesn't actually check that this memory block was allocated. It just assumes, oh yeah, if the user passes a pointer to free, then yeah, the user should know what he or she is doing. So we'll just add this block to the free list, no matter what. So the free function inserts a block into the list. And uh, we identify the start of the, uh, the entry uh, by setting a variable pointer BP, a block pointer, to AP minus one. So why do we do this? Because we have this block, which was originally returned by malloc. And the pointer that we returned to malloc was the pointer pointed to the start of user data. So this is the pointer that we obtain in the free call from our application calling uh, free. So what we actually need to free is the block beginning at this pointer here. So uh, the, the block actually beginning at the header and not at the data of that block. So we always just assume there's a valid header and a block there. We don't check for this. There's, there's a question in the chat. Would it be possible to take a five minute break? Oh yeah, we're already at, at one o'clock. Uh, yes, so I'll just finish with that slide and then we can do a break. <laughs> so uh, what we can do there is uh, we uh, have our AP pointer here and then we use pointer arithmetic again because it points to a header. When we subtract one from it, we go from AP to BP, to, to, so to the start of our uh, data block here. So we subtract the size of our header here. And then this would actually be the element we need to add to our free list here. So we would add this block to our free list here, and then we would need to check additional things. But now we can have a five minute uh, coffee or whatever you need break. So we'll continue at uh, 13.50, okay? Oops. Oh, press the wrong button, no, it should work. And try to share my screen again, uh, which went out of presentation mode. Thank you, Apple. So oh, now it stopped screen sharing, of course, because the window got a different name. Ah, yes. Okay. So, uh, boop, boop, boop. my chat window disappeared. Can you see my slides again? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, there was one additional question. Do you read all code from all groups? No, but we have TAs and they read all group from all code from all groups. Uh, we, we didn't implement automatic tests here uh, just because we did we didn't have the infrastructure ready and I think you can't do it on Blackboard. So that's one thing we're going to improve for, for next year's courses that will actually have an automatic submission system. That's at least what I'm planning, uh, where you actually would submit uh, your code in a GitHub repository. So we automatically know who has submitted, when it was submitted, and then you can run continuous integration tests. So what's done in real software engineering when you work on group projects together. So everyone can check it out. You can uh, simultaneously edit the code, check in stuff, and we can also see who worked on that code, uh, even if we don't want to be control freaks. And then we can run automatic tests. We did this for our operating systems course in, uh, in, in, in Germany before, where we had like 450 students every year. Uh, but uh, we need to install the system here. Do you evaluate algorithm runtime complexity? No, we don't. Uh, we're, we're, we're happy if you can get it working, um, because we know it's a complex task. Uh, so runtime complexity is, is not good for this uh, approach anyways. Um, so, so essentially, uh, yes, uh, we don't care about complexity for grading the, the results. Uh, there, there's a private recommendation here to use GitHub Classroom. Yeah, we'll check it out. That's, that's a good idea. What I, I would love to have infrastructure on premises. So Git, GitHub uh, on our own server, I think is not possible. You can do it with GitLab. I know some colleagues in Germany have a GitLab server for that, uh, but I need to check out if they have classroom solutions. 
All right, so let's uh, continue our discussion here. So we have seen that we have an allocated block that we want to free. The address that is passed to our free function is the address of the start of the data area of this allocated block. What we need to add to our free block here is actually the start address of that block because otherwise we would not release this block of size size here, so the header. So we need to uh, calculate the address of the start of that block BP to be AP minus one, which subtracts because it's a pointer to a header structure, which subtracts the size of our header from AP. So we go from here to the beginning of this uh, allocated block we wanna free. And then uh, what happens is we need to add this to the free list. Adding this to the free list is easy because we know how to iterate through the free list. So we can just add this pointer here in between. So uh, uh, we scan the free list for the correct block. So we start at the beginning. So this is our free pointer here. And then we sequence through the list. So we always go from P to the S pointer to the next one here. And we stop at the last entry before the to be freed element. And this is making it easy. So we can actually compare pointer values here in size. That's perfectly fine in C. In other languages, that's not allowed. So if we know that our pointer we are looking to free, and that's why we keep the list in sorted order here. So if the block to be freed is larger than the block we're currently looking at and less than the next block here. So we'll take a look at how to handle the end of the list in, in a bit. Uh, so, so the next block is that one here. So if we know our BP here is larger than our previous free block and our address is less than our next free block, the blue one on the right hand side here, this is this condition here. So then we know we have exactly found the position in our list where we need to insert this block that's going to be free. So uh, we need to check for a wraparound in memory. So we need to check if the pointer is actually larger than the, the next pointer here. And uh, so if uh, the, the element would, for example, be here at the beginning or at the end, we would need to insert checks for these. And these are some of the corner cases which make this a bit nasty. But if you don't get everything right, of course you'll get partial credit for this. No, no, no worries about that. But that's exactly why, why we talked about test cases, but I'll talk about this in a bit. All right, so how do you insert a block into a free list? We now know that the element is at address BP because that was the element we just calculated. And we have to insert it between the previous free element and the element that is pointed to by that because we have to add it in between. So we have to change the pointer in the previous element to now point to BP. And then we have to change our pointer in BP to change to the next free element in order. So that means we remove that link here and we added this block above here, which is now a free block even if we didn't delete any byte of memory in there. So we just assume it's free because we added it to the free block. Because if this would be a large block of like a megabyte and we would zero it for every free operation, then we would have to go through one megabyte of memory writing zeros to it. And that's a large overhead, which we want to avoid. So the only thing we actually change in this block is uh, actually, we don't, uh, 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 is actually, the pointer to the next one because the size of that block, no matter if it was allocated before, doesn't change because we just freed a block of size that was used and now it's a block of size that is freed. So a bit more complex if you have neighboring free blocks already because you want to have as large free blocks as possible to satisfy more, uh, more, uh, more allocations and larger allocations when you free a block in between. So we know still our pointer to the element to be freed is BP. And we have the situation here that the block before it in memory is free and the address range right after it in memory is also free. So uh, we have the pointer to a previous element in the free list is P. And what we want to have, if we free this orange block on the right, right hand side here, we want to have a large free block that consists of lower of the element we just freed and of upper. And so we need to check if there's a continuous a contiguous memory area to an upper block or to a lower block or to both. 
So uh, what we can do is when we free a block that BP points to, we can check if the next part in memory is in the free list. So if at BP plus size, uh, that's actually the element. So we're currently uh, looking at that one here in the free list that we found. And then when we want to free this, we first check if the next element in our free list is directly after the element we're going to free. Then we make it into a bigger block. So we actually just change the size of our free block here and we remove this second half here. And now we have a larger free block that actually covers the whole area here that's encircled in this red line. Now we can have the other situation that the first block is free. So we could check for this. So if the block in our free list we're currently looking at plus its size is exactly the start of the block we want to free, we can actually change the size of this previous block here and then uh, just, well, uh, have this automatically added here uh, to the list. So we do just add the free list over to here to point to the next block because we could have another allocated block here. So we would copy the next pointer from the block we freed to this larger block here to the front. So that's all. <laughs> yes, and I don't expect you to understand all of this immediately. Some of you have, have already handed in a working solution. So uh, some, some of you actually wrote that, ah, I had no knowledge about C before, but I got it running. Congratulations. I know that wasn't an easy exercise. And I know it was pretty uncommon for many of you. But uh, as, I, as I already mentioned in uh, the, the message I sent out on Blackboard this morning, this is important stuff if you want to do like system level programming, no matter if it's firmware, operating systems, embedded stuff. And this is a very common interview question. So when you apply for a position like here at microchip, ARM, uh, Nordic Semiconductor or whatever, so one of the companies really doing software development on that level, uh, implementing malloc and free, is a common interview question you might get. And this can be in two uh, different approaches. So one thing that's very common with companies, so especially the large ones like Google or Microsoft or, or Oracle, I had this at Oracle actually when I uh, had my interview there a couple of years ago when I applied for a researcher position, is that you have a whiteboard interview. So you have your interviewer and yourself standing in front of a whiteboard, and then you have to actually design a solution on a whiteboard. So for a whiteboard solution, you would actually need to draw diagrams like those we've seen and maybe explain parts of this like writing code on a piece of paper or on a whiteboard uh, to show that you're actually able to understand this. And as I said, this is a very common question in interviews for, for engineering positions. The other thing you, could, you might get is like you have a like two or three hour time slot and uh, you can do, you, you either have a take home exam if you do it over video or something and you have a deadline to submit a solution or you do pair programming with your interviewer. So you sit uh, in front of the computer, so the two of you, and you write code to, uh, and explain it like, you know, this rubber duck debugging. So explain it to a rubber duck that's sitting next to you. In this case, it's the interviewer, uh, what you're actually doing. And you're actually expected to pr not provide a perfect solution. That's, that's not the point in it. But what the point in these interviews is actually, uh, that you're expected uh, to uh, know that you understand the problem, that you can analyze the problem and find a solution that's sound. It has not to be, doesn't have to be perfect, but it has to show that you've seen this before and that you have thought about this before. And that's why I thought if any of you would be interested in working in that area, and I hope uh, I, I didn't really convince you to just do consulting afterwards now <laughs> by my operating systems course. That's, that's what really distinguishes you from many applicants, I'd say, because many universities don't teach stuff like that. In my Oracle interview, like it was in 2015, I think, uh, it was a whiteboard interview, which I wasn't prepared for at all, because it was just intended to be a shake hands and get to know the guys there before we do an official interview. And it turned into a whole day interview, just discussing stuff. And I was asked something similar, like, uh, you have this piece of code given, so how do you do optimization for caches? And afterwards, I was told I was the only applicant who actually knew uh, how to explain caches and how caches worked. Oh, well, so uh, I'm getting distracted, but I thought you might find this interesting. Um, 
So there's a question for the people who already handed in before the extension of the deadline. I'm worried we have to work through the weekend now to make it work perfectly. Since we got to help or get reduced points, no, you shouldn't be worried. We're, as you probably have found out, even though we, we have to figure out some, some problems with Blackboard of actually assigning you the graded points, there's some problems uh, with visibility of points to the graders, uh, which we have to figure out. Uh, so that's why some of you were confused because they didn't get feedback on PE1. Uh, so that's a Blackboard problem again, and we're working on PE2 right now. Um, so you shouldn't be worried. You should know that we're pretty relaxed. So if you have a solution that mostly works, you'll get most of the points. So uh, if it doesn't set fault uh, for, for you, uh, for, for, uh, it's, it's already pretty good. And if, if we miss a corner case, we'll deduct a point or a half or something like that. Did I cover all corner cases? Uh, one corner case I didn't cover, I think uh, I would need to check it if you actually have three blocks to the left and the right of a block you're going to free. So you have to coalesce them. Um, so uh, I hope I didn't miss any corner case. Uh, it can happen to me too. <laughs> Another question in the skeleton file, we're given the control block struct has a size of 16. We are told to align memory to multiples of eight. Well, uh, the easiest way is to use multiples of 16. Now that's, yes, that's probably, yes, that, that's my fault in a, in, in, in a sense, because you all have 64 bit machines right now, correct? So it would be a multiple, uh, the, the size would be eight. That's something I didn't fix, yes. So thanks for noticing this. So if you have this header structure, it contain, consists of a pointer and an integer variable for the size. So on a 32-bit machine, you would have a 32-bit pointer and a 32-bit size field, which makes eight bytes. That's where these eight bytes came from. On a 64-bit machine, you have a 64-bit pointer plus four, bits, uh, four bytes for the size at least, and rounding this up makes a multiple of 16. So that's why you got a block struct size of 16, I suppose. And so feel free to use a block size of 16 here. Because otherwise you'd, you'd get into trouble. That's, that's absolutely correct. Sorry, that's, that's actually an oversight. Yes, we, we should correct this. Thank you. So, sorry, I didn't. I actually didn't notice this because I think the last time I used this exercise, we uh, it was uh, years back when everyone had 32-bit machines. Yes, so round up all blocks to multiples of 16 bytes. That's perfectly fine. And if you have something like this, please, yeah, sure, go ahead and ask this. And uh, also, if, you, if you're just like five minutes before the deadline and you figure out something like this, just write a comment in your code that you changed this from the specification because you weren't, weren't sure. So we are not strict in the sense if you use another multiple here that you would deduce points if you get a working solution. So uh, because we, we all can make errors obviously and that's that's the one we didn't I didn't consider here. Uh, probably I'm doing that stuff for too long so that I'm still thinking in 32-bit pointers. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, yeah, sorry for that. Uh, well, uh, I'll, I'll fix this afterwards. Okay, so the final confusion that was here is that I had a very quick part C edit uh, where I wanted you to design and implement test case. And at least some of you obviously had a Java-based software engineering lecture where you were told how to use J units and stuff like this. Of course, I didn't want you to set up an elaborate testing infrastructure. And you can easily deduce this from the number of points for each partial task. So for implementing malloc, you got four points. For implementing free, you got four points. And for implementing test cases, I think it was two points then to, to get to the sum of them. So this obviously shouldn't include from the amount of time you had to spend setting up elaborate infrastructures. No, what I wanted actually is to have several sequences of alloc and free and for example, test corner cases. So describe which situations can occur. So you should think about the corner cases that can occur here and what you do, what you can do to check for the correct behavior here. So that would involve just writing a bit of C code in the main function and then figuring out, for example, if you allocate more memory than 64 kilobytes. So if you do an allocation of 80 kilobytes, do you actually get a null pointer back to indicate that the allocation has failed? Or if you create a pattern where you only leave whatever uh, 256 byte blocks free in between, 
and you completely filled your memory. So you only have 256 byte free blocks and then you allocated 512 bytes or try to allocate it, then it would fail. So essentially code like the example with sequences of character uh, of allocations and frees and then checking if it is right. Uh, of course, if you wanted to do this, if, you, if you're interested, you could, could uh, try to implement for malloc and free such a, uh, whatever, a, a, a printing function that actually would print the allocated and free blocks like a list of, of uh, characters with one character for each block or stuff like that. But that's not what I expected, uh, but it might help. So uh, adding this function. So what would be the interesting test cases here? Now, obviously try to allocate more memory that, than it's available, that should fail. Uh, Trying to free a non-allocated block or free a free previously freed block is a corner case. But since we don't note any allocated blocks, this should actually work. So uh, it should work in, in terms of uh, not messing up your list, right? Um, if you uh, create an allocation with only small gaps left, that's what I mentioned using alternating malloc and free calls, then trying to allocate a block that doesn't fit anymore in the small blocks, that should fail. You should check if the coalescing with the upper left or even both neighbors work. And you should, for example, try to malloc the block at the start of the free list or at the end of the free list. So that's some of the corner cases I was thinking of. Maybe you find more, that would be interesting. For getting the full points for this, you don't have to cover all, but some of these obviously, uh, well, I, I, I've obviously now given you some ideas of the, for this. Uh, so, so it might be a bit easier, but still uh, it would be interesting to see how you implement these checks. So it may, I made it a bit easier for you maybe to yeah, figure out what to check for, but you, need, you still need to figure out how to check for this. All right, so uh, that's all from my side. So this was a long, like almost one and a half hour session, but I hope it cleared up quite a number of things. It helps those of you who are struggling with this and uh, yeah, uh, that was helpful. Thanks, that, that was the intention. One question here is, uh, do you have a good way of performing the tests in C? Now, but to be honest, I just used printf here to be because I was lazy. So just printing if, if a value was zero, you can use something like assertions. So in C, you have something special where code is automatically inserted, which is called assert. So you can, for example, try to assert like whatever pointer is not equal to zero. And if you write a line like this in your C code, uh, then your code automatically stops if this assertion is not valid. So if you, at this point in your code, your pointer would be zero, uh, you, you, you would get an error message because this is code that's inserted by the compiler that says your assertion failed. So there's a bug in your program. So that, that's an option, but you can also use a regular printf, that's fine. And you don't have to implement checks for all of these, but if you have a reasonable number uh, correctly implemented, we will award the points. So yes, that was a complex exercise and probably something you might have never seen in the last three or years or how, uh, how long you're studying now before. But I think because that's the basic of, of all that stuff you're using right now, I thought that was really interesting and, and it helped really getting to know pointers. Maybe some of you hate pointers now, and I must tell you, the first time I had a C compiler in my hands, that was, I was like 15 years old on a Commodore 64 and I've programmed in basic and assembly. And then I had a strange C compiler, which was by coincidence written by someone who is now a colleague as a professor in Germany. And this was also a teenager. <laughs> and then I did not understand the concepts of pointers, but I didn't have this uh, programming in C book, but only a, a badly written tutorial. And so it took me quite some years until I started university and really earnest pro C programming in earnest until I understood point pointers, even if I knew what addresses were in assembler code. So not understanding pointers at the first try is not, is not unusual. And I, I've struggled with this before, but yeah, like uh, 35 years later, I can say, I hope I finally understood them. So yes. Uh, Printfs are fine. And uh, what, what we're actually going to do is we're going to do a bit more of Unix infrastructure implementation. So in the upcoming lectures uh, next week, we'll talk about file systems, file management, file accesses, and the related calls. So open, read, write, and so on.
uh, we've already seen file descriptors. And so in the upcoming practical exa example, which I'm going to publish probably still today, but well, obviously you don't need to start working on that right away. We'll also implement a typical part of Unix code. We'll implement our own Unix shell. Now this sounds monstrous, horrific. It's not. It's very simple because you can already use fork and exec. You've already seen this before. So implementing a Unix shell is great exercise. Uh, so you can see you can build a small part and another small part. So not only an allocator, but also a real useful program like a shell on your own and get this running. What I would really love to see is an advanced course uh, where uh, this advanced course actually uh, would teach you how to implement an operating systems kernel. I've taught this in Germany many years already, for many years already, and people would like this. I'm, I, I'm going to discuss many things with, with the department next week. And so I would love to have this. Maybe we'll add something like this, this like just an optional for fun summer course for, for students interested maybe in, in writing their own small operating system for a Raspberry Pi. You won't get any credits for this, but you will get experience. And I would have lots of fun uh, actually uh, while teaching this. So you, you can get your own little OS multitasking, preemptive multitasking and stuff running on a Raspberry Pi. That would be lots of fun, but we should have something like this as a regular course actually. So uh, yeah, I got some feedback that somebody was actually not discouraged by this. <laughs> That's great to hear. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, the lectures are all on YouTube if you want to read, watch, watch stuff. And if there's anything, let us know. We, you've also seen that uh, Ruben and Simla have introduced uh, no consulting hours for, for group consulting or so one-on-one consultings. So feel free to contact them, STAs. They are very knowledgeable because both of them are currently working on their master thesis with me. And they're both porting real world operating systems to RISC-V. So both of them are very knowledgeable in C in all these topics. And if some problems are show, show up in, in these sessions, well, uh, let me know or let them know and, and they will let me know whatever. So, uh, I hope that's fine for you. I hope uh, this will help those of you who were struggling. So please don't, I don't want to ruin your weekend. So that's why, why we gave you four days and not Monday morning or something like that. Uh, but we can't ex extend this indefinitely because otherwise we would ruin your Easter break and that's what we didn't want. Uh, so, so I hope I don't ruin your weekends. Those of you who are still struggling, get some ideas. You didn't get a complete solution. We'll obviously publish a complete solution only after the deadline. Uh, yeah, I hope you can understand this, but I hope with these snippets and bits of code, you, you get an idea of how to get this to work. And for those of you who already handed in a, a very good solution or a working solution, don't worry, we're, we're not strict. As I said, we don't reduce points because we, we hate you. We don't hate you, not at all. <laughs> uh, so, so we only reduce points if there are serious problems with your code. So we don't go for performance. We don't go for style. This would be really interesting, but this is an additional, a completely different course teaching stuff like this. So here it's really functionality and understanding pointers and getting that working correctly. So thanks for joining this. I'll also provide a video and I'll try to upload this in, in, a, in a minute. This takes a bit using my slow internet connection here. Uh, so you can rewatch that stuff and I'll also publish the slides. And if there's any further problems, you know how to reach us. So that's all from my side and I have a Zoom session upcoming in 15 minutes. So good that we're finished. Thanks for listening. Have a good weekend and please don't let this stress you too much. And yeah, see you next week. Bye.